Hello everyone. So today we're going to be talking about some Gherkin suggested best practices. These are um, best practices that I suggest uh, based on various projects that I've been on um, just and what uh, have you from the internet. So <clears throat> many of these suggested best practices were uh, laid out in the some of the cucumber books, uh, if not explicitly um, noted. So to start off with, uh, here's kind of an overview of what we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about um, some suggested best practices for keywords, uh, keeping your scenarios and your features and your steps all independent, um, how to connect your scenarios back to your requirements, um, how to combine uh, scenarios into scenario outlines whenever possible, as well as formatting of tables, writing imperative versus declarative uh, scenarios, and what I'm calling the, the five rules of modularity. So to start off with, we're going to begin with talking about keywords. And when I say keywords, I mean the, the given, when, then, but, uh, or and keywords. So <clears throat> this is uh, meant to basically, you want to follow uh, Cucumber standards on which keyword to use. So what that means is um, with the, the given, the given should always be a precondition and it has to be first uh, even if, if it's in the background, you can that's fine, but it's meant to be the setup step or uh, to lay out any kind of preconditions that you might have. When should always be uh, your action and then should be your assertion. And and but are kind of wild cards because they match the keyword that's above them. Um, but is generally used as a negative assertion. Uh, I have found that but is rarely used and many times it can lead to some, some confusing wording uh, whenever you're using it. So if you use it, use it with caution um, just because it, it sometimes becomes hard to read. Uh, so with the, the given, when, then, but uh, ones, you, you generally have it in this format. This is a simple example. Uh, given I log in as a user, when I navigate to the account page, and I click on sign out on the account page, then the home page should be displayed. Given I log in as user one is our precondition. It's, not, it's, it's the setup for the test. The actions that we're doing are navigating to account page and then clicking on the sign out on the account page. Once that happens, those are our actions that lead to our assertion. Our assertion is that we should uh, end up on the home page once we sign out. So just uh, all in all, you need to make sure you follow you know, this precondition action and assertion format. Um, this is an example of when you might have multiple thens in, in a statement or multiple wins. So in this one, we, have, uh, we start with a, a precondition, action, action, and then we do an assert, and then we follow by two more actions and two more assertions. So... This can be helpful if you, you, know, you want to assert multiple things in a scenario. Maybe on your way to, um, in this example, on our way to one place, we're verifying some other things. So given I log in as user one is our precondition, we're navigating to the account page, we're clicking on the sign out button, and then we're asserting that, we can, that we're on the home page. But then we're also making sure that we're able to sign back in. So we're clicking sign in on the home page, uh, clicking sign in on the sign in page and we're making sure the sign in page should be displayed and the invalid uh, user error should be visible. So this is basically checking to make sure when we sign out or so we sign in first we sign out and if we try to sign in again without a valid username then uh, we're not able to basically. So this is an instance where you might want to do two assertions to make sure you've successfully got back to the home page uh, and to make sure that you um, successfully got the invalid user error. This is, uh, this is kind of a bad example because you have then, but you have these two ands in here 
uh, this and is actually not an assertion. You'll see here this then is our assertion. We're asserting that the, the page is displayed, but we're following that with an and. And if we're following that with an and, it automatically means that this becomes a, uh, this follows the keyword that's above it, which is a then. But this is not an assertion, this is an action. So in this format, you have to use the when, which is, uh, which we had in our previous step, just like this. So make sure any of your assertions are, when, are, are thens and any of your actions are whens. Uh, you uh, also, you know, standard, you always start with a given. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a when, um, but you always have to have a then. So you should always be setting something up and asserting something. So theoretically, you could have a given and then just do an assertion. You don't necessarily have to have a when or an and or a but. Those are optional. Um, <clears throat> so this is moving on a little bit to independence. So you should always think of your features as completely independent of any other feature and your scenarios as completely independent of any other scenario. No scenario and no feature should rely on another. So you need to be um, as descriptive as possible with each step to some extent. You don't want to, generally we use the rule of if your step is more than a hundred characters, you need to shorten it. Because at that point, it just becomes a little unwieldy and hard to read. So try to keep your steps under 100 characters, if at all possible. Um, you also need to make sure that um, you that if you're if you're saying if you're wording a step exactly the same way, it needs to do the exact same thing. So if you have two identical steps that you want to do slightly different things in like different features or scenarios, you can't do that. If you, they have the same wording, they will be doing the same thing. Um, and this, this falls back to you need to know that um, the fact that these are matching using regular expressions to connect to the automation is one reason why you can't have two of the exact same worded steps to do two different things is because the regular expression has to know what code to connect it to. And you can't have it to, you know, necessarily do two different things with, uh, by using this regular expression. Also, you need to be able to read it correctly. So if you're, if you're making it say one, if you're making the step inherently do one thing in one feature and do something else in another feature, you're going to throw off the reader because they're going to be under the assumption that that wording does the same thing in both of them. Um, so with, with this, you also should make your steps more or less information independent. Um, you can do stuff with like, if, if you're creating the automation development, you can do stuff with like scenario, uh, what some people call like scenario objects and that passes some information in between scenarios. Um, that's not uncommon, but it's not great practice. Ideally, you wanna make everything that you need in within the step. So an example would be above, uh, given I click on the accept. Now, what if you have multiple accepts on your application? I might not know which one to click. Uh, whereas the one below, given I click accept on the payments page, if there's only one accept on the payments page, I'm good. If there's multiple accepts on the payment page, I probably want to be more specific about which one. But this is generally a, uh, a standard on how to, you know, click on something on some, on some page. You denote it with quotes, denote it with quotes, and then you put your parameters in there. So make sure if you're clicking on something or interacting with something, you need to know where it's coming from because this doesn't know what came before it and this one doesn't know what steps came before it. You should kind of view these as, you know, as if they're executing by themselves. Um, Going back a little bit to what I said before, every scenario should be able to be executed alone because they are able to be executed alone. Whenever you auto, if you automate these, then 
you can tag each scenario and run them independently. And you, you can't make assumptions how the system is going to behave because um, many of these features will run in alphabetical order, but that's not necessarily the case depending on which CI environment that you're using, continuous integration system that you're using, or which system that you're running on. Developers might choose to run some features by themselves due to how long they run for, such as like session management or something, would probably only run overnight. Um, and uh, every feature, again, you can't guarantee what order the features are going to execute in. So no feature should be um, dependent on another because they can't really pass information back and forth for one whenever you're automating them. And you don't want to have to reference another feature whenever you're reading through one. Uh, you don't want to have to reference feature B when you're, refer when you're reading feature A. So this, is, this goes back to, you know, the way it is automated, they need to be independent. You want to make them independent for maintainability reasons because you don't want to have things referencing back and forth and trying to keep all those uh, links, um, you know, in your head. And you want to make it, you know, as readable as possible because ultimately that's the reason for Cucumber is to have a readable test that, you know, can easily be written and automated. Um, making your steps information independent. Um, this is an example uh, where the second scenario requires the first scenario to run. On the second scenario, if we read it by itself, it says, given I click on the account element on the home page, then the account number should be visible on the account page. How did I actually get to the home page for one? Um, you know, th there's no setup here. This is where, you know, we're assuming that the first one is going to run. Given I log in as user one, when I add loan, when I add a loan to user one account, then account element should be visible on the home page. These, if you want, if they're dependent on each other, you can combine, you should combine them into one. Or if you know you need these first two steps, you can either create them in a background or you would just have to, you know, duplicate these steps down in the second scenario. So this is a bad example. Um, this is a little bit better. This is where, um, you know, the you have where I basically took those other steps and added them to the one above. So we have uh, given the user's login as user one. When I add a loan to user one's account, then an account element should be visible on the home page. When I click on account element on the home page, then the account number should be visible on the home page. This is basically combining those uh, steps into just have one. The best way you could do this would be, you know, to move that into a background if multiple things also need that. So if everything in your scenario also needs these first two steps, you can move them into a background so that way you don't have to have it here. And you'll see here um, we have a given and then we're immediately doing an assertion followed by a when and then another assertion. This is fine. Um, it doesn't read it. It's not as pretty as given when and then, but this is what we're doing. We're, we're doing a, uh, a setup and then we're immediately doing an assert and then an action and another assert. So this is fine. This is, uh, if you have multiple, uh, if you have all your scenarios that have the same setup, just move them into a background. Next, we're going to get to how to connect your scenarios to your requirements. So many, sys many uh, companies will use systems like JIRA or Rational Team Concert or Team Forge. Um, these are things that generally uh, are used to track requirements and they usually have some kind of identifier on them. So uh, why would we want to connect the scenarios with requirements? Well, it helps you keep track of which scenarios are included in a requirement. So it helps you show that you have coverage uh, in the acceptance criteria for that uh, piece of functionality being developed whenever you're creating the requirements. It shows that you can trace back from a test case to a requirement, so you're not creating superfluous test cases. It helps show that you have coverage um, whenever you're actually developing the code. So like 
whether you're using the Gherkin to be manual test cases or automated, it shows that you have some kind of test to verify whenever the development is complete. And uh, you can also, uh, if you wanted to, you could create custom metrics to show um, you know, how many tests are linked to a given feature and whatnot. So uh, an example of my suggestion for how to um, have your requirements linked back to your scenario is to just put them at the end of the scenario um, description. Uh, in this one, I used uh, a colon. Some older versions of Cucumber don't like the colon at the end of the scenario. So you can you know, use something else, dash, dash, or something like that. Um, but it should be consistent, and it should be something that you know nothing else is using. So by using this dash here, I'm never using a dash anywhere else in here, and I know everything after the last dash on here will be the connection to my requirements. So these are some examples of like what a uh, requirement ID might look like. RLS1003, NQD1789. These uh, I could then look up in their... In their uh, environment and see what uh, requirement is this covering. Did I actually want to test this? Uh, another way you can do it is you can uh, put a add a comment above your scenario with them in it. The benefit of having it in your description is if that scenario fails during an automated test run, then you will see uh, which requirement it's connected to. If it's in a comment, um, and it fails, whenever you get your report, you won't necessarily see this, but you will see this in most formatted reports. Um, if you, but there's some people who do not care to see the requirements in the uh, actual report, so they leave it here, because sometimes you might have 15 requirements that need to be linked to a specific scenario. The next point is combine wherever possible. And what this means is um, we have a tool called Scenario Outlines, and you want to use them when you can. Scenario Outlines are pretty powerful, and they can allow for an increase in maintainability and readability. I mean, they're, they're very useful. So um, some things that we might want to look at to see if uh, a couple scenarios are good candidates to combine is if most of the steps are the same, uh, you can consider making a scenario outline. And so if you look if you're looking through your feature file and you see many of them that kind of look the same but are slightly different, you might want to see if there's a way that you can maybe reword that scenario to create a scenario outline. Uh, a lot of times you won't be able to just dump everything into one. you'll have to reword it a little bit. but uh, <clears throat> if they're very similar, it's it's a very good possibility that you'll be able to, um, you know, create a scenario outline from them. Uh, this makes it very easy to read, very easy to maintain, and whenever you have to modify one of the steps, you're changing in one place the scenario outline instead of a whole bunch of different ones. So this is an example of like two different scenarios. Uh, this is just used in a, I used a diff tool to highlight the, the differences. So you'll see here, the highlighted ones are the differences, and they're they're fairly they're fairly obvious. We have, um, you know, I enter this into this field, I enter this into this field. Then this error on this page should be visible, and this error on this page should be visible. This one doesn't have quotes. This one does have quotes. So this is an example of how I could have reworded that to you know make not only those two merged but you know i merged four other ones and i did have to reword it a little bit so instead of you know choosing in this one i was entering um, all these fields and uh, just not entering one in this one i'm specifically saying I enter something into all the fields and then clear out the, the field that I don't care for. So there, there's possible that you might have to work around some of how you have the scenario laid out, but many, many times you can make it work uh, very well, and so it's very maintainable. 
Next, we're going to talk a little bit about formatting. So this might not seem like a big thing, but formatting can be very annoying if it doesn't happen at the beginning. Uh, one example is, you know, the, the tables. This top table is an example of one that doesn't have any formatting on it. It's just clearly laid out. They didn't bother to put any spaces in it. And it's unreadable at this point. If you automated it, it automate fine, but it's unreadable as a person. The bottom one, however, has been formatted as suggested in, in you know many of the cucumber books. And it just, all we have to do is add these spaces to, to line everything up. You don't want to add tabs because tabs can be rendered differently in different text viewers, but you do want to add spaces. So these spaces will help line everything up nicely. And you can see the bottom one is much more easily readable than the top one. The top one, good luck reading it. Um, if you're using a, uh, this is an example of, you know, how to format a step table or a data table. Uh, so this is uh, just, you know, kind of convention that we found is that you want to say that this step is, you know, using following information. So, you know, then the result should have the following information. We want to include the word following and we want to include a colon so that they know there's a data table. And this is just kind of a convention to know that like, hey, any, any step followed by a colon should be expecting a data table. Because sometimes whenever you're looking through, like whenever you're looking through your step dictionary, you might only see this and you won't necessarily know that it's using a data table. So uh, also uh, with data tables, data tables don't have to have a header, but since the scenario uh, outline example tables do have a scenario header or a table header, I recommend using a table header and I recommend using uh, your headers as all lowercase uh, and using uh, lower, lower snake case on the headers. So underscore separation and all lowercase. I think it just makes it a little bit easier to read. I find the, if you're not consistent with spaces, it can be hard. And I find that <clears throat> the uh, underscores are usually easier to read for a lot of people than camel case or something like that. Moving on a little bit further, some of you might have heard the term imperative versus declarative. And you might wonder, well, what is imperative and what is declarative? Basically, imperative is when you uh, use low-level steps to, to drive the user interface or, you know, whatever, you, yeah, your user interface, whatever user interface you're using, be it a web browser, you know, database, anything. Uh, declarative uh, describes what a user does, not how they use it or not how they do it. Um, you can basically Google and find out what these are. Um, that's what I, I, I did to find these definitions. Uh, imperative usually means that you have more steps, longer scenarios, and you're giving more detail on how the test is done. Uh, declarative contains all the information needed uh, and you, know, you don't have to have additional information. It's also usually easier to read um, but that being said, a lot of uh, whenever you're doing automation and creating these scenarios at first, um, almost everybody starts off doing imperative just because if you're automating it, you know, you can create a few simple steps and be able to use those in all your code. And they're you know very easy to have uh, those drive, but they can also be harder to maintain that way as well and much harder to read. So this is an example of an imperative and a declarative statement. You'll see the top one, I'm giving the user detailed step-by-step -step instructions. You know, I'm telling them uh, all this stuff, um, but the bottom one, I'm just giving them the bare uh, essentials. Given I'm an authorized guest, when I attempt to access a restricted content, then I'm denied access to restricted content. This, um, you know, this makes it so that you have all your information in the declarative statement, 
but you might have a lot more logic in your automated code to drive that. Um, it's suggested to do the declarative form versus the imperative form, um, and but it's my belief that depending on your style, uh, as long as you don't go crazy with imperative, you can find some happy medium in between. Uh, one example of that is sign in. Um, you can you could have at some point the detailed steps on all the sign in functionality, but if you're gonna be reusing those steps multiple times, go ahead and create a common step that just says, "Given I sign in as user blank," instead of you know ten steps to go through how I enter text into each field to sign in. Um, so my my thought on this is that use uh, declarative when you can, but, uh, don't be, don't, don't make too much of an effort for it. If you're going to reuse a lot of the steps that you're building, go ahead and build that into a declarative statement because then it adds reusability and it eliminates a lot of that code duplication. And so like if you, if you know your sign in process changes, then you would only have to change it in one place versus every place where you laid out all those steps on how to sign in. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, creating your steps in a modular fashion. So what I mean by this is um, you need to be, you need to make your steps reusable wherever possible. So you need to be consistent with your language. If you have two steps to do the same thing, make the language the same. Make them have the same words in them. Um, you can use um, parameters to make them clear. So whenever you have a parameter, I would recommend wrapping it in quotes just so that it's very clear that this is an element, this is a parameter, and this is something that can be swapped out for something else. It also uh, lets the developer, I, th I think makes the developer create the regular expression more easily. Um, it's easier to read whenever you have the same step uh, that does the same thing uh, and instead of having, you know, I've seen some whenever they're writing Gherkin, they'll have five ways of wording I clicking on a page and it just, it kind of gets daunting on, okay, well, why is this one worded slightly different than the other one? So by making your steps all use similar, you know, the similar steps use similar language, it allows, you know, to follow some kind of standardization ideal. So that way, if you need to, you know, extend this code base into another project, you can. Um, this brings me to what I'm, I call my five steps to modularity. Um, <clears throat> the first step is, uh, or the first rule is, if it does the same thing, make it obvious. Uh, you'll see here I have two examples, and it's not as obvious that they're doing the same thing, um, because you'll see here when I click on sign in link on the home page, um, and then this one has when I click on the register button on the sign in page, you know, these look similar, but you know, we have an extra word here. You know, we have link versus button. We have home page, sign in page. Uh, you know, we could rewrite write this and make it a little bit clearer. So when I click on quote something on the somewhere page, you could reuse this anywhere you need to click on something on some page. And this would basically standardize your language for this. And if you're using a page object model, you can easily create this as one step. You could create, I mean, essentially you would make this one line of code if you're able to use a page object model whenever you're developing a web UI. Um, but this applies for anywhere you're gonna be using Cucumber. You know, make your, if, you're, if your steps are doing the same thing, make it obvious, have it use the same language. Uh, rule two that we're coming to is please keep your case consistent. I recommend using a lowercase wherever you can. Um, for example, the top one and the bottom one, 
will not match the same regular expression. It might look the same, but you'll notice here, click is not capitalized here, and it is here. So either the, whenever you're automating this, you'll either have to standardize it anyways and make them the same, or you'll have to, um, you know, account for that in the regular expression. Generally, I recommend just making everything lowercase where you can. Makes it easier. Most of the time, whenever you're automating something, you don't care about case anyway, so you're gonna ignore it and downcase everything anyways. So just make sure you're consistent with your case. If you don't follow my recommendation as leaving lowercase, just make sure it's the same wherever you use it. The next one is, um, I think I talked about this before, is keeping your tables consistent. So in this, we have uh, the, the headers that I'm talking about mainly, and that's keeping them lowercase as well, underscore separated, and keeping the format correct. Um, so for example, this can be kind of difficult to have in here. Um, just because you have to remember that there's always a space here. Um, I just, I usually standardize it, lowercase and underscore. It's a couple extra keystrokes to have to capitalize these, and it can be kind of annoying if you have to go back and do that s several times. Uh, rule four is include all the needed information as if the feature scenario or step were alone. And this is, goes back to my, uh, my independence slide when I'm talking about just make sure you're including what you need. So in this one, we're clicking on sign in, but we don't necessarily know where that sign in link or button or page is. Um, same for this one, when I enter user zero data, I don't necessarily know where that is. Um, but on the second ones, I'm explicitly saying, hey, this sign in link, it's on the home page. And this user data, it's coming from this JSON file. So just give the information that you need um, don't you, this is rule number five, and this is probably one of my most important rules. Don't use Microsoft Word to create, copy, or edit any of your feature files or steps. And the reason for that is that Microsoft uses smart quotes and the auto formatting. Um, so for example, the top one here uses the regular quote symbol. The bottom one uses these, you know, forward, backwards, Microsoft smart quotes. These will not work in most systems. They will not register as quotes. You need, you need to use the standard quotes and not Microsoft Word because this will break many development systems. Just because, you know, usually when you type, you don't add smart quotes. They're a Microsoft thing. Um, and now we're gonna, we're done talking about, you know, the five rules of modularity and most of my big topics. Um, I just have a couple quick things to uh, hit on. Uh, I've just kind of compiled them into a slide. And these are a couple quick rules that I have. Um, generally, if I wanna add a, if I'm just writing the Gherkin files and it's being developed by somebody else, I'll generally add a developer comment with a hash followed by a bang. And this indicates that uh, it's a developer comment if they need more information on how, the, how I think the step should be developed or if there's additional logic that's needed in the scenario, um, I just add this and that means that, hey, dev, once you've done this, remove this comment. It's not necessarily needed. Um, if you add a regular comment, you know, just keep the hash sign in there and this will stay within the feature file. Um, usually keep your comments at the top of the scenario don't put them at the end of the step or at the you know in between steps because that can cause that can just look sloppy and it can cause problems whenever your uh, scenarios are being outputted to a uh, report. Um, <clears throat> this I talked about a little bit before, and that's keep your step length uh, ideally under 100 characters uh, and between 50 to 80 characters. So you wanna keep somewhere in this range of 50 to 80. Anywhere past 100 characters and it just starts to get too long and too unwieldy. So if you have over 100 characters, either think of how to shorten it or consider if it can be broken up into multiple steps. Because if you find yourself creating steps that are over 100 characters, you're probably 
including too much information in them and they need to be broken out into different things as, anyways so that's all i have for this video uh again like always if you have any questions or comments please leave them below uh you can uh, my name is jared sheffer and thank you for listening have a nice day